it wrapped in bubble wrap and presented it to me. It's a Cape Buffalo. It's incredibly heavy and she's very small, but she's one of the toughest women I've ever met. So uh, she managed to carry it in. And do people see a sort of see a big bit of taxidermy and they think, oh, Polly would like that? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I think people definitely, they either associate me with taxidermy or roadkill. I often get texts from people saying, saw a dead fox today and thought of you. I actually view my work and cooking, meat for cooking, very separately, actually, because I did used to think that I might um, eat the um, bodies that I remove from birds, because it seems like a bit of a waste just throwing them out. I would be slightly worried existing on roadkill, maybe when I'm a crazy old lady. Is that your ambition? Well, I think when I'm on, I will be probably a, a quite a hermit as an old lady, I think. I imagine myself living in the countryside with loads of dogs. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the London art scene and I, I like them and obviously if I'm out, if I, I think the, the problem is the times people see me pictured represent probably about 2% of my time, which is when I'm invited out to a party or something. So I've made an effort, I've dressed up and I get there and someone stops to take my picture and I turn and smile with the camera and look like I'm enjoying myself. And often, I, you know, I have a nice enough time, but it doesn't mean I really want to be there and a, such a small amount of my time, but that's when I get photographed. So that's what people see of me, and, and sometimes, you know, what worries me a little bit, actually, that that's probably what kind of, I know that I look in the papers and I see, if I see photos of people at parties all the time, I think, do you, do you ever get any work done? David, food's ready. Everywhere I've lived before, I've been sort of... It's, the work has taken precedence and the life has been, like, sort of shoved in a corner. Now I've got this really nice, clear delineation between work and life with the two separate floors. And I like to make them look really different as well. One's kind of nice and clean and spacious and the other's quite cluttered and dusty. <laughs> No, well, they're very used to it. I mean, he's, I got him as a puppy, and he's just... That's his life. They love it when dead animals arrive in the post. They run up to the box and start sniffing it, and I know that something's arrived. Um, no, they're not, they're not very interested, really, in, in what I do. I've tried feeding them the bodies before, but they weren't that bothered. They just sort of played football with them. <laughs> Made a mess. That's one thing that I find a bit unwelcome, actually, about taxidermy. Sometimes you get, you, you just can't help find yourself imagining what's under the skin when you're petting an animal. So I'll just sometimes be stroking, cuddling the dogs, and I, I can visualise what's underneath the skin because I've done foxes before and they're very similar. And you really, even with humans, you know, I can sort of, obviously I've never skinned a human being, but at the same time I can really visualise now how things are put together. And it's great, it's, you know, on the one hand it's given me a really good understanding of, of, of nature and biology, but on the other hand, it does sort of intrude on your daily life some, sometimes, and it makes you feel, it just makes you feel a bit more sort of prone and vulnerable, really. I think you, you start to realise how... Um, how fragile you really are. I would, I, you know, I'd know exactly how to chop my hand off if I needed to and where to aim for and it just sort of makes me feel sometimes, well, it reminds me of, of how fragile we all are really. So I cut, I, I make an incision at the back of the skull like that. And then across, sort of cut a box in it. And down here. Hmm. 
I'm going to cut this here underneath. This is hit this part here underneath the jaw. Um, I was very lucky. I, I got attention pretty quickly. Well, my work got attention pretty quickly, um, and I think it really is because the material I chose to use was quite kind of captivating to people. Um, that's the tongue. And on top of it, there weren't that many people, there's, there's not many people doing it, so it's far easier to sort of stand out than it would be if I was painting or if I was a photographer or something when, you know, photographers and painters are ten a penny really in East London and you have to be doing something pretty different with it to get people's attention. So I'm aware of that. I realise that, you know, it's not my genius that has brought me the attention that I've got, but now that I've got it, I think that I have to try and use it wisely. The idea behind Departures was really to sort of create an homage to um, an inventor that had created a drawing of a flying machine. It was a kind of carriage that a human would sit in and it would be um, carried by birds and, in, in his instance, eagles. There's just something touching, I think, about that human need to fly. It's not, you know, we're, we're earthbound creatures but yet we always we sort of want to go deep sea diving, we want to go up in the air and we want to experience everything and we sort of have bird envy, I think, a lot of the time. Departures was probably a reflection of the confidence that I was feeling at the time in my work. And also my desire to kind of make things a little bit less ornamental and more monumental. I wanted to see if I could be the sort of artist that commands a space. And I named this piece Foundations Remains because I like the idea that it, it, can, it could be looked at in different ways. It could either be the foundations of a building of something new, or something beautiful that's springing up because it almost looks like, um, like scaffolding or like the sort of foundations that you, you put on a building before the re it's all sort of assembled. Or it could be the remains of something that's, that's you know, a building that's sprung up and then sort of been allowed to die and, and rotted almost. They're all crow femurs, so leg bones and, and the crow. And I made about 20, 30 moulds of them and then cast out 2,428, I think. And then they're all hand painted as well. Which way do you want the shadow? I, I don't think it really matters. Yeah, I like that shape of that shadow. I used to take all the photographs of my work myself, but I'm no professional photographer. So I have um, since had them professionally photographed, um, almost always by the same girl. Ish, stop. No, go back a little bit. Yeah, let's try that. Oh, that's nice, actually. You do get a greater sense of the spiral if you look at it on there. I have to let go of it once it's left the studio. I can't follow it around for the rest of its life. So I think it's important to sort of send it on its way as best you can. I have peaks and troughs all the time. You know, I have these crazy highs where I think, well, wow, everything's going so well, I'm on top of the world. I can do no wrong. And then the next day I'll wake up feeling miserable and thinking, you know, that it's all just a big fluke and everyone's going to wake up to the fact that I'm just a con artist. <laughs> Which is, you know, obviously not how I feel about myself most of the time, but then you get these moments of just huge confidence crises and you think, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? Who's it for and what's the point? But somehow I am compelled to carry on doing it. I will generally always take on a little bit more work than I think I can do. 
I'm almost always in a position of feeling like there's not enough hours in the day to do things. So the wire that's come out of my false neck, I've got to glue it into the back of the skull here. And once that's set, I will turn the skin back the right way around again over the body, over the form. trying to get the widest point of the skull through quite a narrow aperture in the neck. So you can sort of see it, start, it starts to take shape at this point and it's really just a question of pinning things in place, padding things out, bending wires, stitching it up and modelling the head and giving it a good dry and it'll look like a bird again. But all of that finishing off is something you have to be quite fresh for. And it's, I've learned never to, to do that at the end of a day because I need patience for it and I really need to be quite um, sharp. So I generally, if I've been working on a bird in the day, I'll quite often leave it at this point, come back to it the next morning when I'm feeling a bit fresher. I'm just putting it in my studio freezer alongside a few other bits of food because I'm too lazy to go into the stock room. If I'm doing something repetitively, I start to sort of dream about it as I'm going to sleep. I often have weird images come to mind as I'm drifting off. I do quite often dream that I'm working on a bird and it comes to life and attacks me.